so you probably noticed, Will, uh, we have a new laptop on the table here. Oh, yeah. Would well, you look at that in all of its glory? This is uh, this is the new Lou Later laptop for the next 30 days. I'll be trying this out. It's very exciting. It's the LG Gram 17. Now, you probably noticed I'm a bit of a fan of large laptops. I've been using other 17-inch laptops that are a little bit bigger and bulkier than this. And as the name implies, the Gram, this is a very light 17-inch laptop. In fact, they claim it's the world's lightest 17-inch laptop under three pounds. You see how I'm doing this here? You see that? Oh, that's yeah. a that's Gram. That's the LG Gram 17. Uh, it's got a couple other cool things. 16 by 10 aspect ratio. So it's a little bit taller than my last display, which for productivity for a show like this where I'm reading a lot, having a little bit extra vertical space, kind of useful compared to the 16.9 that you see on a lot of 17-inch uh, laptops that are more gaming-oriented. Uh, it's got battery life up to 17 hours and, of course, 10th-gen Intel processors. You can get in a couple different specifications. I'll have links down in the description. So shout out to LG for sponsoring the laptop for the next 30 days. Very shout exciting. Out. Let's see if it does the trick. Why right don't up. we? Uh, first story of the day, we're going to talk about the Google Pixel 4a because... All the hype is around this particular device. I still don't have mine. Who knows when it's going to show up here? Talking to people at Google, it's all tall types of Canada stuff. I'm very upset about it. Border troubles. Border troubles. They say, you're in Canada. You, you're in Timbuktu. Leave me alone. We'll get to you later. It's usually not the case, in fact. In the past, uh, Google Canada has been really responsive and able to deliver these things. But there seems to be some issue with this particular model. But that's not important because... We still have other uh, content to look at and examples and samples, including this wonderful article here from Android Authority, looking at the Pixel 4a versus the iPhone SE camera. And of course, with these two devices, the camera is a huge component in any comparison anyone's going to do. Uh, they, they both are sort of aiming at being the ultimate camera on a budget. Both of them are aiming squarely there. In the case of the iPhone SE, we're looking at software, camera software, identical to what you're having on the far more expensive flagship devices. Same thing on the Pixel. You're getting camera hardware software, very similar if not identical to what was shipping on the flagship version of the Pixel this year. And coming in at low prices. So what are we talking about? $399 versus $349. So they're just... They're really Back doing battle here. Yep. And I have to say, if I only had $400 to spend on a smartphone and I was interested in camera performance, these are two devices I'd be looking at as well. Mm -hmm. And I believe you'd be doing the same. Oh, yeah. Four, and eight. so what we have here are actually some, some really nice comparison shots stacking these two devices up against each other. And some of them are kind of more landscape-style photos. We have a couple slightly more low light and then we have some selfies as well what i want you to do is zero in on this first photo here because this it really illustrates the thing that i've been saying about pixel photos for a while and why it's to my taste and honestly this article doesn't aim to to, to nail down a clear winner the goal here is to showcase the attributes of each of these two cameras so that you the user can decide which you prefer because there is a taste component to this well and the uh, pixels on the left? Yes, the pix this is the pixel, and then swing over, that's the iPhone. Now, for me, the biggest, well, there's two big differences here. The color temperature, the pixel trends cooler, which is to my taste buds. Mm. I understand some people, their complexion and, and taking photos of people, and there's, there, there are some who just are more into the warmer tones. And then others who are more towards the cooler tones. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, you might be into it. And so for me, if I had to select between these two, so that's, I'm going to select the cooler photo from the Pixel. And then the other piece is contrast. So the emphasis on the iPhone, it looks to, it looks to me like it really wants to retain shadow detail. And that can be important for a lot of people. They say, I don't want to lose detail. That sounds like a bad idea. Mm -hmm. However... In contrast to the contrast of the pixel photo, you lose a little punch in the dark regions. You lose a little contrast 
or the appearance of contrast. And you'll notice when you when you skim over to the pixel photo, the black just in the bottom corner. In the bottom left? Yes, the black just yeah. boom, just hits you right where you want to be hit. And so this is a difficult edge to walk down to figure out, well, well, well which is better? Honestly, it's preference. Mm -hmm. Neither of the photos is bad. In fact, they're both fantastic for the price. 349, 399. Look at the type of photos you're taking in 2020. It's incredible. Uh, if you scroll down to the next one, you'll see a similar kind of behavior, but in a different photo. Actually, I think this one illustrates the color balance thing even more so. How the iPhone goes warm, a little more yellow, and then a little more blue on the Pixel photo. And then the same contrast thing happens. As you scroll down, maybe you can go all the way to the flowers. I see substantially more saturation in the red on the iPhone photo, and I see more line detail, or what you might call sharpness, but this could be enhanced in software as well on the Pixel photo. So this, again, it's a selection process, whichever is more appealing to you. Some people like a saturated image. And then I just wanna look at one more photo here, Will. If you scroll down to the brick wall with the sky, so this one aims to see uh, in a little bit more detail which each, what each of them are doing in these dark portions, the more unlit portions of the photo. And as you'll, as you'll tell here, you get more black in the pixel photo and you're able to retain slightly more uh, shadow detail. Go all the way over, swipe it all the way over, particularly in this bottom right corner here. You can notice it and then go back to the iPhone photo. You see you got a little, just a little bit more detail on the iPhone photo because it's not aiming to really black things out quite so much. Now, the other standout for me here is the sky. Mm -hmm. The sky on the iPhone photo is just, the color looks a little more surreal. It looks a little more saturated, once again, compared to the pixel sky, which it's not lacking blue. It's just to my eyeballs, it looks a little more like sky blue and a little bit less amped. But again, this is all personal preference, and I have been clear on this show for what feels like forever that I just happen to have a preference towards the way that the, not even the Pixel camera, but just Google's camera software interprets an image. Mm -hmm. And this has been true for me when I've loaded that software successfully onto OnePlus de devices and seen an improved quality to the photos that I've actually preferred to the stock camera app. It's definitely mostly leaning on how each of these companies and each of their uh, groups of software engineers decide to, to, to tweak the attributes of how these images look. And it's incredibly complex. And it's really a prefer There is a huge preference component to it. Mm -hmm. So what about you? Where do you land, Will, if you had to pick between the two aesthetics? Uh, I would go with uh, the Pixel. Mainly because, I don't know, maybe I'm just used to it. But, the look uh, of it, yeah. They have like a really natural look. Mm. Um, you see it as being the more natural look of the two. Yeah, even yeah. though I prefer it to be a little bit more flat yeah. or less saturated. Okay. But I do like the darks. It's it's nice. Yeah, yeah, because there is there are some people who feel that the HDR look of pumping up the shadow areas so that they retain detail can look a little bit artificial even though there's no question it's a superior detail that if you can see what's happening in the shadows on a te from a technical perspective mm -hmm. but if a photo whatever whatever it is you see in a photo that you like or don't like is it, like i said previously it's up to you i will say if you have the detail in the shadows you could go into a photo editor and uh and still black them out yep. to a certain yep. degree. Whereas if you lose the shadow detail, it's hard, harder to get it back. Yes. So there's an argument there as well, if you're the type of person that likes to go in and edit your photo. But I think a lot of users just pop and post. And if you're a pop and post, then I think the pixel photo, you, for again, for my taste, when, once you push that on social media, as you get a lot of people, what phone did you take that with? You see that a lot. Whereas I feel the the iPhone photo, it might be a have a little bit more uh, opportunity in post to kind of tweak the tweak the hmm. the uh, the output 
So, but anyway, once again, it's we all, we all win. Everybody point. wins. It's well you said, know. and everybody especially wins in this case because it's three forty nine and three ninety nine. Yeah, and there's choice. And there's choice. It's fantastic, and it's from the big brands. It's 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 Apple. It's Google. Mm -hmm. It's uh, readily available globally. Except for if you're in Canada here and you're waiting till <laughs> September, which I don't plan on waiting till September. I'll try to find a way. Google, get in touch. Find a way. I, I say, really, this, do I have to drive somewhere? Can I get over the border? I think, no, because things no, no. are still, things are still wacky, but I feel like we can find a way. Mm -hmm. We'll see what we can do. Uh, the, here's a funny story. Speaking of, of uh, budget smartphones, 349, 399. What excuse does Tom Brady have for using a six-year-old iPhone? See, he could pick up what he can even pick up an iPhone SE and be ahead of the game. Mm. He could pick up uh, if he's willing to switch platforms. He could pick up one of these new Pixels, mm. and he has no excuse. Well, when you're making twenty five million dollars a year, I don't even think you need to save the seven hundred to yeah. go move away from even a flagship. But people are reading into this. It's kind of uh, an interesting. It's an interesting little uh, thing uh, thing to think about. How can you have a guy making this kind of money that has no interest? in upgrading his smartphone. What does it say about us? Uh, who's weird? Is he weird or are we weird? Because we're, we're, you got uh, 50 bucks in the bank account and you're uh, doing the payment plan on the upgraded flagship because you got to have the hottest. Well, we're definitely weird. Okay, so we're the weird ones. <laughs> but people, people on social media thought he was weird anyways because they hit him up after they saw the post. So he put a post, I guess it was on his Instagram story, and... In it, it shows a, his dash. It looks like, he, by the way, he drives a Ford F-150 because I'm familiar oh, with this okay. dash. But it shows, he's showing how hot it is out. He's not, he doesn't want to talk about which phone he's using. He's showing that it's 99 degrees out mm. uh, and a couple of flames. He's just enjoying the sunlight. But then below there, you see it says Tom Brady's iPhone 6 Plus because this interface shows you which phone you have connected when you're on the audio display. Mm. And when people saw that, they went bananas. What is this guy doing using an iPhone 6 Plus? That's an old phone, Well, That's a six-year-old iPhone. Hmm. Do you even remember this iPhone? Yeah. You know how we go on there and we talk about how a ton of people upgraded to the SE and they were holding on to those old phones? Uh -huh. I didn't know we were talking about Tom Brady. I don't know. Who, I thought that it would be a person who, who, didn't, who was uh, saving their dollars, a person who wasn't making $25 million a year. Uh -huh. But it turns out even Tom Brady is not immune. Now, here's the next piece to the conspiracy here. By okay. the way, if you're an international viewer, Tom Brady's a, the most famous NFL quarterback. He makes a tremendous amount of money. Just to get that out of the way. Uh, here's the here's the twist for you, Will. Okay. Cuz you know I got to bring a twist. Brady and the Patriots, they were under investigation over uh, activities oh. Oh. with the with the with the uh, the deflating of the footballs or whatever. I don't know what's alleged and yeah. Deflate gate or it's had a bunch of different names, but they, they, they were being well, fans and even the NFL looked into it. There was an open investigation into whether or not they were tampering with the equipment, with the footballs. Hmm. And I and other things as well. And so they actually Brady, along with other Patriots, had to be interviewed and they were asked questions. And he when he when he was asked to testify, he stated that he would destroy or give his assistant to destroy his cell phone and SIM cards every time he gets a new cell phone. Right? Because they were asking for the records. They wanted to know if it had ever been talked about. They wanted to see the old cell phone. He said, nah, those old cell phones get destroyed. Mm. Making it sound as though new cell phones were being swapped in and out on a frequent basis. Mm. Yeah, every eight months. He previously claimed to destroy his pre, uh, cell phones every eight months. Well, definitely not in this case. You see that well. Hmm. So either, I don't know, I'm just saying. Now, to be clear, if there was anything nefarious going on, I don't think he would have made light of it because he came back on Twitter and made a joke about it. He said, thank you for the birthday wishes. Might treat myself to a new iPhone this year. Hmm. So he made light of it and made a joke about it. So who knows? Maybe he's got more than one phone. Maybe he keeps yeah. that phone in the truck because it's got a bunch of tunes on it. Or there's so many reasons that this could possibly be... Some people just have some keepsakes on a particular phone and they don't want to back it up or transfer it over. They just hang on to an old phone. Yeah, maybe that's just his car phone. Exactly. There's there's a lot of uh, explanations here, but if he, if he was a guy still using it, the battery life would have to be horrendous on there. Mm. 
Or, or Unless it's always plugged in. But also imagine this. Imagine if Tom Brady went to the Genius Bar and got a battery replacement mm -hmm. instead of getting a new phone. He was like, you know what? This phone, there's nothing wrong with it. $25 million a year. Mm -hmm. And he says, you know what? This phone is nothing wrong with it. I'm going to replace the that. battery. Incredible to think about. People, yeah. uh, people do crazy things. We'll, we'll never know who the crazy one is, if it's us or if it's him, but... Uh, I couldn't imagine day-to-day -day life on a on a 6S. Mm. It'll be tough. But you know what? I would live. And so would you. We would live. Yeah. We would survive. And important to note, shout out to Apple here. Uh, Apple fans love to say it. Software updates. He still he gets the he can get some fresh get yeah. some fresh iOS. If he was on Android, a 6-year-old Android phone, he'd be on some old <laughs> he'd be on some old software likely. Yeah. Uh, we got a new Poca phone coming out. This is to tackle, to target, to do battle with the OnePlus Nord, presumably. Now, I haven't looked at a Poco device in a long time. You remember the original, the flagship killer? I don't know what they were doing. Were they selling it at a loss? It had the top tier chip in it at a very low price. It had more RAM than it should have had. I just, I can't forget it. People were super psyched and interested in that original phone. It, it turns out it was probably likely a marketing ploy, a little loss leader. You lose a few bucks on that one, but you make a real name, a, a brand name that people aren't going to forget. But they're still doing it. They're still kicking it. Poco Sub brand has released a number of new phones in 2020 packing value for money. That's the aim. And often they are rebranded Redmi devices. The Xiaomi brand, it's hard to keep it all together. All the sub brands and everything that's going on over here. Uh, but there was a tweet that came out from a Poco executive that said, one plus Nord or dot, 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 four dots, wait for the new Poco, question mark, and then Poco coming soon. So it seems a number of brands are interested in this uh, one plus Nord situation, not just Poco, because if you look at the Pixel 4a, that thing was, oh, it's going to launch. Oh, it's going to launch. Oh, it's going to launch. Oh, it doesn't launch. And then... What is it, a day before the OnePlus Nord actually goes on sale conveniently? Yeah, there's that pixel again. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened to all the colors. I don't know what happened to uh, a plus model or whatever else, but just fine, you can have it. Mm -hmm. Really interesting timing on that. And same goes for Poco here where they get the tweet out and just say, hey, before you buy that thing, we're about to do something. Now, I have to be honest, I am not familiar with the rumored processor that may go into this thing there's a thinking here that the next poco could be a rebranded redmi 10x series handset it could be something else but that's the current rumor sitting here on android authority and that one's got a dimensity 820 processor which i don't know anything about and something tells me at least for my comfort level if i'm spending that money if I've got OnePlus Nord money, I have a I have a comfort level in the Snapdragon stuff over the MediaTek stuff. It doesn't mean it's not good. It just that's my familiarity level. Maybe people can sound off in the comments if uh, if this is a MediaTek chip that that can level the playing field, so to speak. But that's a rumor at the moment. There's also a rumor on the battery sitting at 4520 milliamp hours and a triple or quad rear camera system. Again. These could be some of the specs if it is based on this Redmi 10X series device. But just to give you a refresh on the Nord, you got 5G 90 Hertz OLED and Snapdragon 765G. So it's a tough, that's a that's a tough place to be doing business right now at that price point. You add Pixel 4a to the mix, and I'm it's a tough decision to be made. Mm -hmm. Because that thing now 349, oof, tough, man. Three to four hundred dollars. Tough. It's three it's to getting, 500. It's getting competitive. It's very competitive. And that's good. Once again, I feel like we have a theme going here. The customer wins. Mm -hmm. But I want to ask the Indian fans specifically if they had the choice to choose between OnePlus Nord, wait for the next Poco, or pick up the Pixel 4a. Which one do you go for and why? I'll be looking at the comments. I'll be checking it out. Apple is researching a curved iPhone body with a wraparound display. Let me ask you something before you scroll any further here, Will. You see that device on the left in that image. 
is it does it remind you of anything that you've seen before? Like a phone? Does it remind you of anything? A burrito? <laughs> when you said like a phone, I knew you were going to go somewhere f to some far off land after with your <laughs> with your guess. Oh, yeah, For me, I looked at that image and I immediately thought of an iPod, an old iPod. I don't remember which generation it was, but I believe there was an iPod that had this shape to it. And for those that are just listening and not watching the show, what we're looking at is a prototype iPhone that has a, I believe that's called a convex curvature. And yeah. con convex is like this, uh, well, it's the opposite of concave. You have this kind of perfect curve that goes edge to edge so there's no flat portion it's not like a display that curves once it gets to the edge and then is flat in the center the entire thing curves all the way to the sides so oh i know uh a stick of deodorant a stick of deodorant right yes yeah <laughs> that's not bad either stick of deodorant might follow this exact same shape so this is actually uh, coming from a patent that was granted, I believe, on Tuesday. Really recent. Yes, granted on Tuesday by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And essentially what this showcases, if you scroll down a little bit more when you look at the patent, it's a render at the top of what it could look like. But it's a new shape for a phone, maybe a comfortable shape to hold and interact with. This could be about the human hand and what's interesting to, uh, to grip. It is... It is interesting that this is happening on, like recently, that this is happening on Tuesday and not many years ago, because recently, Will, of course, there's there we, we've seen a variety of flexible OLED designs. Mm -hmm. And whether it's folding or just an unusual, that's the same shape. That's the that's iPod so Nano fifth generation. Had the same shape to it. Now... Was that a touch screen or was it all click wheel? Because I don't think it mattered the display very much because you weren't touching it, but it definitely had that curvature to it. So you can go check that out. See the comparison for yourself. iPod Nano 5G. What a time, Will. Yeah, and it was smaller too. Tiny little thing. Yeah. All the Nanos were. What a throwback looking at that device. Imagine unboxing that today. Oof. Anyway, so as this new flexible OLED stuff has become available... There's a rethinking going on at all the major brands over how a screen should be implemented or could be implemented now that you're not governed by, that your design is not governed by the flatness of screens. Mm -hmm. And so as much as everyone's excited about the folding stuff and rolling and flipping and all that, there, there could be some interesting stuff that happens in the more traditional form factor, but just with the shape of the screen. And that's sort of what this patent is pointing at. Going into the details of the patent, the display could be made from either flexible OLED or LCD panels. Now, the LCD panel, I don't see the point of this. If you do a flat LCD panel and then some sort of a glass over top of it, like they did on the old iPod Nano, you kind of lose the effect of it. Mm -hmm. And that's a downgrade. So I would, I would assume it would be some sort of flexible OLED. The patent goes into the uh, various touch sensor layers that would be in there as well. They got to be super thin to meet this curvature. But one thing I'll say, Will, is we, there is a kind of, well, there's a feeling, a sense of fatigue around the slab, the rectangular slab that we have mm -hmm. and just how science fiction it is and what it's going to take for people to really feel some next era and get excited about smartphones. I saw actually, uh, what is it? Mr. Mobile uh, does a series called When Smartphones Were Fun. Mm. And it's about some unusual uh, smartphone designs over the years that may or may not have taken off, but definitely don't exist anymore. And so there's all kinds of flippy, spinny things that show up in there. And it's true, there's something fun about form factors and i had many of these phones over the years by the way that are featured in this series and so one way to get over smartphone fatigue would be a new form factor or a new some sort of striking design element like a completely new shape to the front and 
not just a small waterfall edge or something like this. I don't know if it's folding. I don't know if it's a new take on what the slab looks like, but Apple is, well, as you can tell via this patent, they're not done experimenting with, this doesn't mean they're gonna make this thing, but they're certainly playing with the idea of goofing around and possibly landing on some sort of new form factor. Um, of course, I look at this rendering and I become concerned with unintentional touches and that whole story. Yeah, and swapping, We're, swapping with your deodorant, mistakenly, you know. picking up the wrong. Yeah, you're just tapping away. You're tight. You're texting on your uh, speed stick or whatever it is. <laughs> you know, uh, Apple marketing chief Phil Schiller steps down from the role. I never, I never uh, interacted with Phil Schiller or anyone at Apple for that matter. Maybe, maybe, maybe this is good news for uh, Unbox Therapy. Because if he was the marketing chief and he was not interested in sending us the Apple stuff, maybe the new guy, his new guy, the new guy is like, I'm a huge Unbox Therapy fan. Actually, I can't believe they, they don't have the uh, Apple stuff yeah. to test out prior to launch because they've got this phenomenal channel. That's what you would say if you were a new guy at Apple, right? No, you probably would never say that. They'd be like, get out, you're fired. How dare you? Yeah. Uh, anyways, no, Phil appears to be a cool guy. He uh, is always involved or has been involved historically in the keynote presentations. And, you know, he comes up with the uh, uh, with the really the, the nice attitude and the excitement. He comes across with all that, Will. Mm -hmm. Maybe a plaid shirt here and there. And he's been he's been on the software side i remember he did an interview with john morrison from tld about laptops he appears to be a laptop guy and he does go back he dates back like a number of executives at apple some uh, who who have actually left recently or stepped down or changed roles or whatever I, we have johnny ive as you remember it's like the steve jobs era apple is kind of shrinking hmm. of course you got tim cook you're gonna have tim cook for a bit. I, I don't think Tim Cook's going anywhere, but Schiller has accepted a new role and his role is going to be working solely on the app store and no longer, he's no longer going to have that marketing role. What about the term? Hello, There's a term here. Uh, Apple fellow. Hold on. Let me search for it. Got to take care of the dogs, you know? Oh yeah. Big part of the HQ over here. Yes. So he's an App Apple fellow. Apple fellow. That sounds like, uh, is that some Lord of the Rings type of thing right there? Yeah. A f uh, fellowship of the ring. Yeah, this is a nice term that they use. Somebody who was there, who's moved on. It's like some sort of royalty. And I know in their, in Apple's press release, they actually said he, he moves on to become a felt like almost like it's a it's an upgrade or something like he's reached some sort of next level status within the the cult he, he surpassed he, yeah he's the high he hit the high priest level or something uh but uh, i tend to think that this is more like a sort of soft retirement mm -hmm. if you look at his statement he says uh i'll 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 keep working here as long as they will have me i bleed six colors but I also want to make some time in the years ahead for my family, friends, and a few personal projects I care deeply about. So that looks like you're just trying to chill a bit. It's a big time role. You know, you're, you're, you're trying to uh, enjoy your life. It's a lot of stress. Tim's cracking the whip. The investors are cracking the whip. Mm -hmm. It's a young man's game. Mm -hmm. And I respect that. So shout out to Phil Schiller, even though we never talked. I never got an iPhone early. Job well done. I watched many of many of these keynotes, and uh, and man, he's he was around. He was around in the glory days. Yes, he was around in those early keynotes. He that's that stuff is tech icon status mm -hmm. for Phil Schiller. So shout out, enjoy uh, you the family time and and everything else, the beach, whatever, the margarita, whatever you want to do, the books you never got to read. This is what you do, Will. Yeah, when big you, bucket of win. A big bucket of win, as there Will likes to say. Will's trying to get some new catchphrases over here yeah uh ps4 software sales have spiked during the pandemic 
Now, we knew gaming was doing well, but the question was how well and where. And I had a feeling that the console business was uh, revitalized by this lockdown because, you know, once you got a little more time, you sit on the couch and the PC gamer, the PC gamer is the, in, the more intense gamer. Like the, the world situation isn't going to impact to the same degree, whereas the console is a little more casual, which means now that the new time opened up, oh yeah, let's crack open that console, let's download another game, whatever. I mean, this is just me speaking, mm -hmm. speculative nature, as is as exists here on this show from time to time. But you scroll down here and you see people have spent 83% uh, more year on year for digital software sales on the PlayStation. Did you hear that? I said 83% more. And that brings it up to 3.72 billion in the in the PlayStation store. Now, important to note, Will, people to get addicted to what is it, those uh, free to play battle royale types, the Fortnite types, the Warzone types. And they're in there. What are they doing? They're getting the skins and they're and they're buying things. And they're they're addicted and they spent 3.72 billion. No, of course people have bought games. In fact, Sony says a big part of this, The Last of Us Part Two. Mm. Look at that. Look at you, Will. Puts a smile on your face. You played the game, you're a big fan. You were yeah. conflicted. You played the game, you loved it. It was great. So you can understand people spending money on that. They also say that new game, Ghost of Tsushima, which I haven't played, you haven't played. But a no. lot of people are talking about it. Yeah, I heard good things. So that game is apparently also a strong performer, but it came out too recently to be included in these numbers. So we're going to see even potentially even better numbers in the next one, in the next quarter, because Sony says, hey, that one's doing better than we expected too on the uh, digital side. Now, important to note, even though the digital sales go up, the hardware sales in packaged games go down, 22% down which is to be expected, especially in a time like this. Although you bought a physical disc recently. Yeah, I, I, I would like to... So you braved the... Uh, the hardware. You braved the, the hardware sale. You braved it out there. Yeah. But well, I can see how no one's going out yeah. to buy things. You know, it makes yeah. sense. Yeah, you, you can understand. But if you got a slow connection, you can still... You could order the hardware title mm -hmm. on Amazon. It comes to the door. Oh, yeah. That's fine, too. You do that, too. If you really like to have the the physical game that said as far as buying a new console it seems a bit everything is ps5 now so mm. you go buy a new console that's a bit that'd be a bit strange so i understand why that those numbers would be down everyone's waiting for that next one and then the other thing that is stand out to me is if you're spending all this money on digital software for the playstation 4 Aren't you a bit concerned that this new one's coming out that you'll probably get and then you're going to have all this old software that you just bought in the lockdown? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm just talking, hey, look, if you get the entertainment out of it, who cares? Like you played Last of Us. You spent 60 bucks. Mm -hmm. 60 bucks US yep. would be the, the price. Did you get $60 worth of entertainment value out of it? Yeah, I would. I would say so. You did? Yeah. There's so, replay value and everything. So it's fine. So you don't need to be worried that it's only on the PS4. And even if you do pick up a PS5, you still feel like you got a good deal. So anyways, PlayStation at home is doing well. 83% improvement on those software sales. They're in it to win it. Donald Trump says that the U.S. Treasury should get a cut of this TikTok deal. Uh, we've tried to cover this as closely as we can. I read about it as much as I can. It's the developing story, obviously. We went from TikTok might be banned some... People in the U.S. don't like it in, in government, including Trump, to sitting around waiting for details, to rumors that Microsoft could be in talks to buy it, to an interview, I guess, on Air Force One uh, where Trump says, I'm about to ban it. You can, you can put me on a record here. To new details emerging tr where Trump says, 45 days if you want to make a deal. To the latest, which is, if you make that deal, I want a piece. Yeah, give me a cut here. I want a piece. And I mean, to be fair, the U.S. Treasury is not him. He says that the U.S. makes it possible for them to do business. I think this is a political move. Well, I mean, I said this on the previous one. Some of this stuff is practical. Some of it is signaling. Here's where I stand. I'm hard. I'm tough on China. I'm tough on trade, whatever it might be. Uh, 
well, we, you would never know the full incentive structure behind this thing. What what would lead to this series of events the way that it's going down? How much does it help him on a personal level for the U.S. Treasury to get a few dollars? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But his argument is, and it's not all that different from the way China treats its domestic market by only letting you in if you play by certain rules. He's saying, okay, you want the U.S. customer? The U.S. wants a piece of your profit. That's kind of where it's going. Now, I'm not saying that I abide by that idea. You know, this could, it can, in certain circumstances, stifle competition. Uh, you could imagine if he said something similar to, I don't know, Toyota. And all of a sudden, and they do, sometimes in the form of tariffs, mm -hmm. right? Is this, this is like some sort of digital tariff in a weird way. It's obviously different because it's an acquisition and it's a, he's getting a piece of an actual specific negotiation in which, he he's the one demanding the negotiation. So, I mean, he holds all the cards. It's a Godfather-type mafia move. Mm -hmm. Like, let's be clear about that. You force the sale, then you say, and I get a piece. He puts them, what decision can they make here? You have TikTok, tremendous, enormous user base. They lose India, get banned completely over there. They lose all those users and all the potential to monetize those users through uh, ad revenue down the road. Mm -hmm. And then... The, the other big market to make money, and it's important, re remember, ByteDance has Douyin. They have a domestic product like TikTok already in China. Mm -hmm. So for those saying, isn't China uh, good enough? TikTok isn't the Chinese version. The Chinese version of TikTok isn't TikTok. TikTok, that portion of the thing corresponds with the, the international business that ByteDance does. Yes. So... The evaporation of the U.S. market, they get nothing for everything that's been built. Mm -hmm. It's an all or nothing type of thing. They either do this thing, and this is where the leverage comes in. They either do this thing or maybe don't do it on some principle. Go ahead. Delete us. We don't need it. Or they take what they get and they say, you know what? Can we get $50 billion and we have something to show for all the work that went into building this crazy popular app and the money we spent on musically mm -hmm. can we get an update on that can you tell me will how much money bite dance paid for musically because you want to recuperate that at least there's not that many big markets left in the world 800 million i mean to, between 800 million and 1 billion is what bite dance paid for musically alone to then merge it and create the app that we know as tiktok so they, I mean, they're going to want to get something back here. Yeah, this is a serious ultimatum here. It's a serious ultimatum. And by the way, he doesn't say we want 10% either. Look, can I, can I just quote the man here? Substantial portion of the purchase price. What is a substantial portion? That's like at least 40%. And, 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 and there's been rumors of a $50 billion deal. Yeah. Holy smokes, this thing is heating up. I'm really curious to see how it plays out. Of course, China says, no way. Uh, China says, we're not going to go for it. The state-run China Daily newspaper said on Tuesday that Beijing would not accept the theft, in quotations, of a Chinese technology company. And it also warned that China had plenty of ways to respond if the administration carries out its plan, smash and grab. Hmm. You know what smash and grab? That's like, I believe they go into like a convenience store, a gas station store, big group, and then they all at once so that no one can be uh, reprimanded. They just all smash and grab things and then right. take off. That's what they're calling it. So the war of words heats up. The economic warfare heats up. I don't know where it goes, but uh, I mean, it could get, it can, it could get ugly. Mm -hmm. We'll see. TikTok and, and ByteDance, they're really between a rock and a hard place on this one. Mm -hmm. uh, Microsoft's still in the running, by the way. Microsoft says, we're going to try to get a deal done next 45 days. They think they still got a chance. Imagine them, though. They got to negotiate with ByteDance, but then they got to negotiate with Donald Trump, and then they got to negotiate with China. Like, Imagine being Microsoft right now. They're like, sheesh. We're in the middle of everything over here. Yeah, We're just trying to... We're just trying to recoup from that mixer debacle. We're trying to build Halo. Yeah, we're trying to... We got an Xbox. I mean... Yeah. But anyways, ByteDance, uh, TikTok, obviously, 
tremendous scale. And and you know what, Will? A lot of people are interested, not just Microsoft. In fact, there's a report that Apple may have expressed serious interest in acquiring TikTok. Wouldn't that be the weirdest thing ever in 2020 if Apple got TikTok? Apple, TikTok, what? It would make sense for them to get into social media. They have no play there. Uh, they, they obviously appear to be interested in content because they did the Apple TV Plus stuff. And they had the news piece that they tried to put out. They have increasingly turned towards services to generate revenue. So it's not the craziest idea. But of course, they came out after the rumor emerged and refuted it immediately. You see, mm. that ain't on brand for Apple. Didn't you see Tim Cook in, in Congress? He says he only makes the best things. That's it. Yeah. He's very particular. Apple is very particular. Apple fellows don't approve. Yeah, the fellows. They, they talk to the fellows. They talked to Schiller, and he said that's a no-go. A high fellow. <laughs> high level, high fellow. Yeah. But the rumors have actually been swirling not just around Apple. Apparently, Google and Facebook have also expressed interest in acquiring TikTok in the past. Mm. And it's it's actually unknown the, the scope of negotiations ByteDance might be in right now. Imagine you're talking to Microsoft, and you're talking <laughs> to Microsoft about numbers in the range of billions. You're talking about big numbers with Microsoft. You're telling me you're not going to call up Google. You're not going to call up Facebook and just at least have a couple of words. Mm. You're telling me you're not going to do that, Will. Come here. I feel like even a guy like you might have a couple of words. And you're going to just say, look, this here's the specs on this deal. Are you interested at all? Now, the only difficulty comes in that you would also have to get this approval. And those other two companies, Google and Facebook, people already think they're too big and too powerful. They may not approve even Apple. Mm -hmm. Who knows if these things get approved, which is part of the reason why Microsoft lines up so well. Because they're kind of that second tier right now. They weren't in Congress. Bill Gates moved on. He's doing, what's he doing? Charity and... Uh, conspiracy theorists say he's all about the vaccines and whatever. I don't know what Bill Water. Gates is up to, but he's yeah. it's a lot of philanthropy yes. right now. And Microsoft used to be the anti-competition poster boy back mm -hmm. when they were shipping uh, web browsers alongside Windows. They already went to court. They did all that. Then they've been happy to be in that number two. We're back here. We're Microsoft. We get the game console. We got the... Uh, uh, the LinkedIn, we got the the operating system, we got a web browser here and there, you know? Mm -hmm. We don't even do the phones anymore. Although, yep. they got the Android product coming out with the Duo, and the Surface product doesn't do that bad either. Mm -hmm. So there, they've got a couple things going on, but for whatever reason, people don't put them in the same camp as Google and Facebook in the like, ooh, I'm scared, ooh, I'm scared realm. territory. Yeah. Which they used to, and that's changed, so that might be why they're the a perfect, the uh, candidate, perfect candidate, yeah, to to court this relationship with ByteDance and the U.S. government and the Chinese government. Oh my goodness! Elon Musk says the uh, Cybertruck was created with zero market research and it could flop. Mm. Uh, that sounds like such a thing that Elon would say. He doesn't. It's funny sometimes. It's like a weird roundabout reverse psychology way of praising what you're working on. Right. In that no traditional executive would say something like this, usually. But when he comes out and says this, it almost has the opposite effect on you. Where you're, you, you, you read it and it's so honest or so seemingly unusual that you read it the wrong way around. I see that and say, ooh, look at the balls on that guy. Right, I cre He just created a huge product in his company, but he did it with zero market research and is fully aware it could, could flop. I say, damn, that feels, that's a tough move to make. And all of a sudden, you have increased appreciation for making the tough move instead of sitting there saying, what an idiot. Like, you might read it if you read it the right way around. Mm -hmm. uh, so he has this effect. It's the same thing when he says, the stock price is too high. You say, oh, you're so honest. Can I have some stock? Yeah. Is it like an honest thing? You think he's too humble? It's. I think it's a thing where, and I don't know how calculated it is. I just think it's a thing where we're so not used to hearing it. It's some type of new age marketing. It's just like this hyper transparency. 
It just really gets people going. You get a glimpse behind the scenes, behind the curtain. Mm. You feel like you're in the meeting, sort of, mm. to have an executive talking to you like that on Twitter. The brass taxes. Yeah, you just don't see that kind of thing. Mm. It's the same when you're following along all the other projects and they're sharing uh, prototypes or diagrams. Uh, I mean, when I remember when they were first talking about the Hyperloop and you started to see napkin drawings of how the thing would work. And you're like, whoa, I don't... You don't normally see the formulation of big ideas like this. Mm -hmm. And so everything is usually, is, it seems to be, a, it has historically been secretive executive life and executive thoughts. And so there's something attractive about this, this type of dialogue from an executive who has so much on the line. Now, I can give you the exact quote here. Customer research, question mark. We just made a car we thought was awesome and looked super weird. I just wanted to make a futuristic battle tank. Something that looks like it could come out of Blade Runner or Aliens or something like that, but was also highly functional. Next quote. Wasn't super worried about that, and he's referring to how well it will do, because if it turns out nobody wants to buy a weird-looking truck, we'll just build a normal one. No problem. There's lots of normal trucks out there, that look pretty much the same. You can hardly tell the difference. And sure, we could just do some copycat truck. That's easy. So that's our fallback strategy. Hmm. <laughs> and it's been very transparent and actually uh, true. You make waves with the Cybertruck. You collect 200,000 refundable $100 deposits, including mine. <laughs> and if when it comes time to buy it, everyone asks for a refund, you still had a tremendous amount of press that you would have had to pay for. And you don't have to manufacture the trucks that weren't pay, paid for. So you go back to the drawing board and you're still Tesla. Mm -hmm. And maybe maybe you actually have a cyber truck and some other truck alongside that's uh, slightly more traditional. Yeah, That's not impossible either. But it's cool to see that the options are open. And as much as, as divisive as the cyber truck design has been, you can't say that it's quiet. You you have to admit it's been noisy. You have to admit it got people talking about Tesla again. Mm -hmm. And part of the thing when it comes to hype around products, part of the thing is what you want to target is love and hate. Not that, that you're one, the one thing you don't want to have happen is indifference. You don't want to have people just say, oh, okay. Yeah. Because that lack of reaction eliminates any kind of ground level marketing potential mm -hmm. that just people will be chattering and talking about it. Mm -hmm. And it, man, people are chattering and talking about this. You can't deny it. Nope. Uh, there are apparently idiots in private boats that swarmed the, spa the SpaceX Dragon capsule as it splashed down. I don't know if you followed this news here, but did, yeah. if you were watching the landing or splashing of this capsule, which, by the way, doesn't happen very often, according to Jalopnik, this is the first splashdown of an American crewed space capsule since the Apollo capsule from the Apollo Soyuz joint U.S.-Soviet Union space mission in 1975. Can you imagine? No manned capsule splashing since 1975? Doesn't that really? seem crazy? Hmm. But anyways, that's what, that's what Jalopnik is stating here. So the capsule comes down, splashes, and then all these private boats swarm it in a sort of semicircle around the fringe of it including this famous one waving a Trump flag right in front of oh, the camera. Yeah. <laughs> These are privately owned boats. And at first uh, glance, you might say to yourself, well, what's the big deal? They want to catch a closer glimpse. And maybe a lot of people would be susceptible to being attracted to do the same. However, apparently it's quite dangerous to do this. And, well, the, first off, you may in some way interfere with the actual crew that's got to go and get to the capsule. The rescue. The rescue and yeah. retrieve it. But also, the recovery, t uh, recovery team detected nitrous tetroxide, which is a propellant 
for the Dragon's maneuvering rockets, which was in the air, air around the capsule. And they had to wait for those fumes to dissipate before removing the astronauts. The private boaters didn't care. Imagine what they could have inhaled. So, yeah, I, it could be fun to get a close look at this thing, but, but maybe you don't know the whole story on it. So yeah. I believe this article, this story here, works as a warning for future private boaters that witness uh, one of these capsule splashdowns. You might want to get a pair of binoculars. And just keep a little more distance. And you can still see and spot everything. Or you get one of those super folded zoom lenses on some of those new smartphones. There you go. And you go zoom in, what is it, 20x. And you don't even need binoculars. And you can keep your distance. And you don't need to inhale nitrous to troxide. Everybody wins, including those attempting to retrieve these men who just splashed from God knows what height at God knows what speed. And probably aren't interested in shaking hands with private boaters after a trip like that.